Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Spencer Williams, Associate Professor of Law at Golden Gate University. We'll be discussing his article, Contracts of Systems, which is forthcoming in the Delaware Journal of Corporate Law. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Spencer, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Spencer, when I buy a car or I rent a wedding hall or I acquire a company, that, of course, is a contractual process. And I wondered if we could start the conversation by thinking about, in terms of the architecture of that contract, what does it look like? Is it just a stack of papers that says contract at the top, or is it more than that? Yeah, so contracts can take a lot of different forms depending on the context. You know, we can have anything as simple as just an oral agreement between friends, all the way to, you know, multi-hundred page complex merger agreements. Most contracts that are studied in the business and, and legal academic context are typically reduced to some form of writing. So it might not say contract, you know, stamped across the top of it. But typically, the contracts that we look at in legal and business academia are some form of written agreement. Some deals, though, are so complex and so multifaceted that they're not actually just one document. They tend to be a series of documents, a series of interrelated contracts that effectuate the overall deal. So this is something that uh, kind of one of your previous guests, Kathy Huang, has talked about before in her research, this idea of interrelated contracts that effectuate an overall deal. So things like M&A and venture capital financings are typically structured in this manner, where multiple individual contracts will work together to effectuate the overall transaction. So if a contract can be split or layered into different documents, there are certainly going to be many terms and many subterms in those contracts. How should we interpret those terms and, and make sense of them? Should we take them one by one, or is there another method that we should be using? Well, traditionally, the approach has been a term by term approach. And so I refer to this as contractual reductionism because contract scholars have traditionally taken this reductionist approach to contracts, you know, viewing a contract as a collection of terms that are all kind of put together in a big basket. And then we can you know, analyze each of the terms individually and look at its potential effect on the contract and its potential effect on contractual outcomes. And this contractual reductionism approach has been applied throughout traditional contract scholarship. So everything from contract design to contract interpretation, and a lot of the biggest issues in contracts research over the years has largely been done under this kind of broad umbrella of a reductionist approach. The problem is though that this reductionist approach misses a lot. It misses a lot when it comes to interaction between interaction between terms. It misses a lot when it comes to contractual structure. And so a line of more recent scholarship has started to push back on contractual reductionism and has started to look at contracts as more than just a collection of terms. And so Kathy Huang and Matthew Jenajan had a recent paper where they looked at the importance of contractual structure. And this paper is uh, fairly representative of this line of research that is starting to say, no, reductionism isn't enough for looking at contracts. We need to take a step back and take a broader view of contracts and the terms that make up contracts. In your paper, you frame contracts along these lines as being complex systems, and I'd like to delve into that discussion in just a moment. But first, what are complex systems? What do you mean by that? Is 
this a legal theory or something that's borrowed from another discipline or is it an interdisciplinary idea? Yeah, complex systems theory is interdisciplinary. It's an interdisciplinary area of study that's been around for you know many decades at this point. It initially came out of a combination of physics, biology, and computer science. And it arose as a response to uh, researchers in those areas feeling that traditional scientific reductionism was not able to properly model and explain complex systems. So a, a definition, a simple definition of a complex system from complex systems theory, there are many but a pretty simple definition uh, that captures a lot of what I talk about is that a complex system is a system that is composed of numerous parts that interact in a non-trivial manner. So to give you and your, your listeners an example, you know, take a car. A car is made up of thousands or tens of thousands of different parts. But if we broke the car into all its constituent parts, and then just dump them in a big pile, we don't have a car. We have a pile of parts. And so it's how the parts are put together and how the parts interact with one another that forms the overall car. And the car's ability to you know, have a passenger use the car to travel at great speeds and travel for great distances, that property of the car, that ability of the car to function as a car, is not a property of any of the individual parts of a car. It's only a property of the car itself once all the parts are put together in a particular way. And so complex systems theory, the goal of complex systems theory is to help understand how complex systems like cars and many other complex systems, how they function. And so complex systems theory has been applied across a broad range of diverse complex systems, everything from living organisms like cells and all the way up to humans, economies, cities, technology systems, ecosystems. All of these systems are complex systems and complex systems theory has been applied to most of these systems to help gain a better understanding of how they function. And one of the key findings of complex systems theory is that complex systems exhibit a surprising degree of similarity and common behavior regardless of context. So whether we're talking about a biological cell or whether we're talking about a firm or whether we're talking about a social network, there are common properties across these contexts that can be used to help better understand how the complex system functions. And so in the context of contracts, most modern contracts fit this definition of a complex system, a system made up of numerous parts that interact in a non-trivial manner. And so we can use complex systems theory, we can apply it to contracts to better understand how they function. What properties of complex systems do we observe in contracts or should we observe And how might that change how we understand contractual terms and engage in contractual interpretation? Just as you say, we can't have a pile of auto parts and expect it to transport us from point A to point B. Would that imply that we can't have a pile of terms, for example, expect them to achieve whatever the the ends of the contracting parties are? So if we carry the analysis, the complex systems analysis over to contracts, we see that the terms, the individual terms, are the parts of the system, like the parts of the car, and they interact with one another in a particular manner that produces the overall contract, which is the system. We can also see that individual contracts themselves can also be thought of as parts in a higher order system such as uh, an M&A deal or a VC financing deal, where the individual contracts work together to create the overall deal system. And so your original question was, well, what are these common properties from complex systems theory and other complex systems that we see in the context of contracts? And so I identify many 
of these properties in the paper. But just to talk about one that I think can be pretty informative is this idea of nonlinearity. So nonlinearity is a property where the system does not respond in a linear fashion to an input from its environment. So instead, it responds nonlinearly. And so in the context of contract, the contract system, if it receives an input from its environment, say, for example, a change in law, a change in contract law, or a change in how judges interpret a particular term, that change in law is not just going to affect that one term. It's potentially going to affect many other terms in the contract that that term interacts with. And it's potentially going to affect higher order properties, emergent properties of the contract system itself that are in part produced by that term. And so even though the change in law or the change in interpretation is targeted at that one specific term, it's going to have ripple effects throughout the remainder of the contract. And so if we start thinking about a contract as a complex system, we can see that there are pretty significant implications for contract design by lawyers, contract interpretation by judges, and contract analysis, particularly by legal technology companies. So I'm going to give quick examples of, of each of those implications. So when we're talking about contract design, ex-ante design by lawyers, most modern contracts, particularly in the context of these big contracts done by big law firms, things like, things like venture capital financings and M&A deals, these contracts are not drafted from scratch every time. You know, lawyers use kind of form-based precedent drafting. And so when a junior associate sits down to start modifying a past set of contracts or a template set of contracts within a firm to start working on a new deal, often the associate will start tweaking terms from the, the deal or from the template to fit the new deal at hand. But as we were talking about before with nonlinearity, if the associate changes one of those terms or a set of those terms, the changes are probably not going to affect just those terms. They're going to have ripple effects throughout the rest of the contract and through the rest of the deal. And so giving lawyers tools to better understand the systemic effects of changing individual terms will enable them to draft more effective contracts and more resilient contracts. On the interpretation front, we have judges after the fact interpreting contracts. Once again, we see that an interpretation of a particular term is potentially not going to affect just that term. And so if judges also have tools to understand how modifying one term might affect the rest of the contract, and this is particularly relevant in the context of severing terms, and whether a contract can potentially be severed, helping judges understand those systemic effects can enable judges to make more effective interpretation decisions. And then lastly, on the analysis piece, we're starting to see a lot of legal technology companies use a variety of technologies, most notably natural language processing, to take real world natural language contracts and break them down into their constituent terms and subparts for analysis. But as we've already talked about, a contract is more than just a collection of terms. And so while these legal technology companies have gotten really good at breaking contracts down into their constituent terms, just breaking a contract down into its parts is gonna miss a lot. It's gonna miss a lot of complexity. It's gonna miss a lot of how the contract actually functions in practice. And so being able to break a contract down to, into its parts, but then still represent it as a system and represent the interactions between terms and the emergent properties of the overall contract system will enable the legal technology companies to produce and develop more accurate analytical products. What key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this conversation and from the article? 
And are there any open research questions you'd like to pursue from this article? I think the highest level key takeaway is that a contract is greater than the sum of its parts. It's more than just a collection of terms. And once we start viewing a contract as more than just a collection of terms, as a system, complex systems theory then has a lot to say about how to design contracts on the front end, how to interpret contracts on the back end, and how to analyze contracts, particularly using legal technology systems. As far as subsequent research and where to go from here, I think the next step is to bring the theoretical work that I've done in this piece empirically to real world contracts and to sort of start empirically modeling real world contracts as systems. Uh, One direction that I'm planning to take this is to take real world contracts and generate network maps of the contracts and of the deals that they're a part of to see how all the individual terms are actually interrelated with one another and interact with one another and use those data points to generate an actual visual network map that lawyers and judges could potentially use to understand how terms are linked with one another in the overall contract system. Another interesting area that I plan on looking into is to see what complex systems theory has to say about this idea of contracts being quote-unquote complex and this idea of contractual complexity. There's been past research and past literature talking about the complexity of the law and complexity of contracts, but those previous investigations into complexity have tended to proxy complexity by either the length of the contract or the number of words or the linguistic complexity of the contract, just looking at you know how complex are the words and the sentences. But once again, I think that's missing a lot. In particular, I think it's missing a lot of the complexity that comes from the interaction effects between terms in the overall contract system. And so I'd like to see more about what complex systems theory has to say about where complexity comes from in a system where there are lots of interaction effects going on. And then lastly, if if any of your listeners are interested in learning more about complex systems theory, I personally found it really fascinating to delve into this area of research. I can give some book recommendations that you could potentially link to if you think that would be good. Sure. What would you recommend? If your listeners are looking for just kind of a high level, relatively non-mathematical approach to complex systems theory, I would recommend Complexity, A Guided Tour by Melanie Mitchell. And if they're interested in diving deeper into the weeds and into the math of complex systems theory, I would recommend An Introduction to the Theory of Complex Systems by Thurner, Hanel, and Klimek. Our guest today is Ben Spencer Williams, Associate Professor of Law at Golden Gate University. We've discussed his article, Contracts as Systems, which is forthcoming in the Delaware Journal of Corporate Law. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Spencer, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks a lot, Andrew. It was great talking with you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. Andrew Jennings.